That was an absolutely beautiful video, wasn't it? Well, I'll begin this story one warm September evening in 2006. And Washington State, where my husband Tom and I were living, is so beautiful at this time of year because it's literally transformed into a bright patchwork of colour. And I'd taken my four little kids to the local park to collect some of these lovely leaves. And a young woman noticing my obvious bump. I was seven months pregnant at the time. She held open the gate for me and she asked me when I was due. And as we chatted, the conversation turned to politics. And she told me of the real right-wing element emerging in the United States at the time. She said that even women's right to choose was now under threat. I mean, she said with intensity, what if the baby is disabled, for heaven's sake? And before I could respond to her, her lift arrived and off she went. A few weeks later, driving home late along the freeway, I switched on the radio and I heard a woman's voice and what she was saying immediately grabbed my attention because she was talking about her son. His name was Matteo and he had Down syndrome. And the host was asking her what life was like with this little boy. He was special, he was precious. She rejoiced in all his achievements to date. The love and the joy that emanated from her voice was unmistakable and I found myself moved to tears. But during my pregnancy, my fifth, I had no cause for concern whatsoever. I remember that our 20-week ultrasound, our obstetrician had assured us that the baby looked absolutely perfect. I remember well his parting words. Well, mum, he said, it's number five, so should be plain sailing. In fact, I was so confident that with this baby, I was going to take the plunge, literally, and have a water birth at home attended by midwives. I presented Tom with the meticulous research regarding its safety, and after I'd assured him that he had no stage to, had to get into the pool, he reluctantly agreed. So Kathleen Rose was born at 6:15 a.m. on November 2, 2006. She weighed in at six pounds and seven ounces. She had been my shortest labour and quickest birth yet. This tiny, beautiful doll of a child floating upwards into my arms. I'll never forget that moment. I'd heard many mums before talk about the awesome beauty of birth, and I could never agree, because my previous four had been intensely painful and anything but. But Kathleen's birth was so different. The midwives described it as textbook perfect. We had a wonderful first hour together as a family, as the older kids tumbled into our bedroom, excited that their new baby sister was here at last. But two hours later, despite my best efforts, she still hadn't fed. And when our midwife suggested that we take her for observation to the local hospital, I started to panic. Within minutes, we were on the freeway and heading towards Seattle Children's Hospital, which was about a 40 minute drive from our home. And when we got there, no one seemed in any panic at all. Doctors came and went, and two more hours later, we were totally exasperated. And then I knew with great certainty that I needed to baptize her. So I grabbed the cup of water Tom was holding, literally poured it in Kathleen's head, and then my mind went totally blank because I'd never baptized anybody before. But somehow the words came to me. Lord, I said, we desire baptism for our little girl. Help her and strengthen her. And then I baptized her, Kathleen Rose Harkin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then I doused her with a little bit more water just to make sure the job is done properly. But what happened next we will never forget. A horrible blue colour was visibly moving down her body and across her legs. I screamed, doctors came out of nowhere, pushing tubes down her throat and pummeling her chest again and again. The night they flew, racing down the hall towards ICU, and all we could do was follow. But Kathleen didn't die that day. Against all the odds, she survived. When we next saw her, she was ventilated and on a drip. Not a pretty sight. And the days that followed were a whirlwind of endless tests. The results came back in quick succession, each one more depressing than the last. It seemed that every part of her little body was imperfect in some way. Her heart, 
her kidneys, her digestive system, her eyesight. Within a week, the geneticist there had diagnosed her with the chromosome anomaly trisomy 13. I'd never even heard of it before. How on earth, I said, could one tiny little extra chromosome cause all this? But it did. And the information they gave us at our diagnosis meeting was dismal. She won't ever walk, she won't ever talk. 90% of these babies don't make it to their first birthday. If diagnosed before birth, she would have been termed incompatible with life. Now at one week old, she was termed life limited. But Tom and I were amazingly unfazed at this point. We'd seen her baby dying before our very eyes. We'd seen her turn blue from head to foot, and she was still here. And what's more, she was now surviving off the ventilator. And we were so grateful for that. And we really believed that her baptism, hastily performed as it had been, had strengthened her enough to survive that first day. And in the weeks of her hospitalization that followed, there were many dark moments, many times when we really didn't know if she would pull through. But she did. Prayers and masses were being offered up fervently for her, both sides of the Atlantic. And I was so blessed to belong to an amazing network of faith-filled homeschoolers in the Seattle area who literally sprung into action. And I'll never forget their kindness and their sheer determination to do whatever it took to help us, from, from a daily delivery of meals to our home, to cutting our lawn. Word had spread about this Irish family in Seattle and had several unexpected visitors. A beautiful relic of Blessed Kateri Tekawitha was brought in by a group of sisters who work with Native Americans in the region. Rosary beads were brought in from Knox Rhine, and even water from Lure reached my hospital door. Not to mention the unexpected phone call that came through to our room one evening. Hello, the gentle voice said. I'm just calling to see if I can help you. You see, I too have a child who was very sick when he was born. He needed complicated hearts and he has Down syndrome. I couldn't believe it. The Center for Bioethics in Philadelphia. And the conversations at Tom and it was so important to have the right attention, such as ventilation or surgery, especially after Kathleen's diagnosis. You don't need to do this, you know. And weary as I was, I knew immediately what he meant, and a chill went down my spine. As I thought, if with just one word from Tom or I, we could just give up on our little girl and withdraw treatment and let her die. Because unlike the other more perfect babies in the unit, Kathleen, because of her diagnosis, had no rights whatsoever. And I wanted to ask him, how so? How could we do away with her? Maybe take down her drip? Turn off her oxygen? Or maybe, I thought sarcastically, just take her out of her incubator and let her freeze to death. But instead, I uttered up a prayer, mustered up all the dignity I could, and just turned and stared at him silently. He made a very hasty exit. Many doctors, however, were at this stage much more positive and continued to follow our directives without question. But we were the ones setting the standard, and because of that, they treated Kathleen as an individual and not as a fatal diagnosis. Because although she had many anomalies, on closer examination, none of her organs were found to be fatally affected. And she got the very best of care. And six weeks later, following surgery to address her reflux and have a, a little feed tube inserted, she was off oxygen and ready for home. And I think because Tom and I were so upbeat and positive about her throughout, the medical team thought, you know, that things were just not sinking in, that the reality of her situation was somehow going over our head. So the day before her discharge, they called us to a meeting. There were about a dozen or so medical personnel piled into that room. And questions were fielded at us one after another. How will we cope with this child? Were we really aware of how serious her condition was? She would never be able to do anything. She would never be able to go to school. She'd never be able to walk, never be able to talk. She'd need 24-hour care. What was our plan? And had we really thought about how this would so negatively impact our other four children? We calmly assured the team that we would continue to love 
and support our daughter and help her reach her full potential, whatever that may be. We requested at this time home oxygen and a monitor, but these were repeatedly denied us. They assured us that they wouldn't discharge her if they needed these. We realised later, of course, that the medical team were drawing a line under this episode of Kathleen's care, and if we needed this level of intervention again, we knew we would probably have a fight in our hands. But the day for homecoming is one we will never forget, because we literally went from one storm to another. Yes, the day Kathleen Rose was discharged from hospital was the same day the worst storm in over, thir in over 30 years hit Washington State. We were only home hours, with 10 different medicines to administer by feed tube, which I was really nervous about, and totally dependent on electricity to, fuel, to power her feed pump, and our whole neighbourhood went into total blackout. Power lines were down for days, the Red Cross had tents erected to provide warm food and heat, but thankfully we found refuge in a friend's basement, one of the few homes in the region that still had power. But after that little adventure, things did settle down a bit. And Kathleen, for the first year, did amazingly well. Both she and her feed pump came everywhere with us. It was our new normal. She was a tranquil wee baby who was responding well to us and was making mighty attempts to move around and crawl. It was a happy first year. And then our doctor sent us for a sleep study. These results were startling and would really turn our lives around. She was found to have severe obstructive sleep apnea, so basically she would stop breathing many times during the night. The consultant was astounded she was still alive. And not having had the monitor that we'd asked for, we had no idea. They really thought she would not survive much longer at this point, her apnea was so severe. So it was then that we decided to take time out and come back to Ireland. If Kathleen's time with us was coming to an end, we thought, we should really spend whatever time we had left with her back home with our extended families. But despite an absolute roller coaster for a year back here, with many hospitalizations, she just kept bouncing back. <laughs> and somehow, even her sleep apnea gradually rectified itself. But because of her diagnosis, the inevitable encounter with consultants at this side of the Atlantic again had to take place. Did we desire intensive care for her if she should need it? Did we want her resuscitated? Doctor, I would say, she has a chest infection at present. How would you treat a child with the same complaint who did not have trisomy 13? And by the time she was three years old, Kathleen's health had stabilized remarkably, and she was going from strength to strength, no longer requiring oxygen at night, or indeed even a monitor. At four years old, she started at her local special school and became quite a little character. She was so active, in fact, that staff had to let her out to whiz up and down the corridor every day in her little wheelie walker. They even had a trampoline placed inside the classroom just for her. And today, Kathleen Rose is in the creche down the hall, and she is an amazing seven-year-old. She absolutely, she loves school and is most known for her smiles and her big bear hugs. She enjoys the rough and tumble of family life with her six brothers and sisters and loves interacting with them. She's a popular playmate in our house as she always does what they want and never answers them back. <laughs> so often I will see her being giving rides, her raising ones in the washing basket by her brothers or being dressed up by her sisters as a fairy or a Disney princess, complete with makeup and nail polish. She also really loves to annoy us regularly by standing in front of the television, or her very favourite one is getting us all up before six in any given morning by kicking loudly on the door for cut. And often the loving cries of, oh shut up Kathleen, give it a rest, <laughs> will be heard echoing through our home and we will hear her giggling and kicking all the louder. A very interesting time was when her little brother and sister were babies. No matter where I placed that pram, and despite her limited eyesight, she always managed to suss out just where they were. The others would shout, Mom, come, Kathleen's got the baby. 
and I would have to rush and protect them from her big bear hugs. But as a family, we're so grateful to God for allowing us to have this precious time with Kathleen. We know she's a little miracle and that the time we have with her is a total gift. She has taught us so much about what's truly important in life and to be thankful for what we have. Her health, of course, is still fragile, but in the last five years, she's only once required hospitalization. So every few months when her chest gets bad, I can care for her at home. And as I began to search the internet for other children like Kathleen, the stories that I read both uplifted me and concerned me greatly. And I learned two main things. Firstly, as we've seen here, that parents of children with fatal or life-limited conditions were cherishing the time that they had to parent their child, no matter how short. And when given the option of this perinatal hospice model of care in the United States, for example, the response was overwhelmingly positive. And the second thing I learned was that some parents had been convinced by the outdated and inaccurate medical information given them that intervention after birth was always a waste of time. So often children alive and kicking after birth were not even examined to assess their individual needs. No oxygen was administered and sometimes no fluids. They were not treated as a unique child, but as a fatal diagnosis. And as I read these heart-wrenching stories, I thought of how truly blessed Tom and I were with Kathleen, that she had not been diagnosed before birth. And I find myself thinking, how can modern medicine be advancing so far in some areas and be so very behind in others? It's amazing, isn't it, how we as a culture pride ourselves in being so superior to other ages with our huge developments in the fields of science, communications, and medicine. We can send someone to the moon and perform complicated organ transplants, but the sinister movement of eugenics is never far away, cloaked, of course, in compassion. How good we are at pointing out the greatest evils in world history, and yet how blinded our culture has become to the greatest evils ever to be unleashed on humanity in our own time. Abortion, eugenics, and the observed philosophy which goes with them of total relativism. How good our culture has become in convincing parents that it is a responsible and even compassionate choice to end the life of their disabled unborn baby before birth and even after birth. In countries where abortion is legal, as we've seen today, up to 95% of children with disability are aborted. You know, from a human rights perspective, this is an unjust tragedy, from heaven's perspective, not sort of an abomination. In Ireland, however, this is not the case. Each year here, 90% of parents do not abort their baby following a dismal diagnosis. And I'm so privileged to be part of the Every Life Counts initiative and to join together with other parents to tell our stories. This project has provided much-needed, up-to-date fact sheets to tackle the misinformation around the issue, and we are urging the Health Minister to make perinatal hospice care available here in Ireland as a matter of priority. To help parents like Aileen cherish the time they had, however short, to parent their, their little ones, creating precious memories that sustain them after their child's passing. The Every Life Counts Group is also organising a Remembrance Day in June for families that have lost a baby, either before birth or after birth. And this promises to be a beautiful event, which will go towards healing and helping precious memories be shared. We also need to positively engage the Irish media on this issue. So there will also be an opportunity for media training for the many, many, many parents who wish to speak out and tell their stories. Our laws here still protect babies with severe abnormalities and disability. And because of this, we have an amazing culture of life and a great love for our special needs citizens. Just last Friday, Tom and I attended a 40th anniversary celebration at Kathleen Special School in, in Cavan. And as the senior class treated us to songs and poems, I marveled at the response they evoked from the packed audience. Everyone was rooting for them, supporting them, loving them in their obvious imperfections. 
These children really do bring out the best in all of this. But sinister moves are underway to change all that. The Center for Reproductive Rights, which is a wealthy and powerful American body, is paying for a court case to be taken against Ireland at the United Nations, accusing us, ironically, of cruel and inhumane treatment because our laws still protect babies with severe abnormalities. The babies they describe as incompatible with life, children like Kathleen Rose. But we are determined to fight back. They cannot silence the voice of so many parents who love their children and believe that every child should be given the gift of time. And we are determined to go right to the heart of the United Nations ourselves and demand that our government speaks up for our children and that the United Nations listens to us when we say that irrespective of life expectancy or disability, our unborn citizens have value and human rights that must too be protected. In a world too full of cynicism, hopelessness and despair, we must continue to welcome and to protect these special souls sent to us as pure vessels of love. You know, our country will never be an economic giant. We will never be a political giant. But in protecting the rights of our most vulnerable babies, let us be, as one Irish philosopher has recently said, let us be a spiritual giant, an educational giant, and a cultural giant in our world today. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Tracy. What a remarkable story and a remarkable mother and, and woman. And we're so lucky, I guess, to have Tracy, who's willing to speak out and speak up for babies who were conceived with life-limiting illnesses. Um, just, we're going to move on to the next section of the conference just before we break. For, just before we break in a few minutes for a 15-minute break. Um, and in the early part of last year, I remember being at home and I was watching the Vincent Brown TV show, and Claire Daly, TD, was on the show. And they were debating abortion, and Vincent Brown was asking her questions on abortion, etc. And Claire Daly was answering as if she was some sort of expert on pregnancy and maternal health care and all of this. And she was basically saying, you know, if Ireland, doesn't le if Ireland does not legalise abortion, women are going to die. Uh, women are in jeopardy in Ireland because we have a, a ban on abortion. Women need to travel to England for care during their pregnancy that they're not getting here because of Ireland's ban on abortion. And no challenge back, no, quest, no, no challenge by any other panellists, by Vincent Brown. And I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. How can Claire Daly, with no medical background whatsoever, be able to say, spin this lie on, on, the, in, on the TV with no challenge whatsoever? And because of that interview, I started thinking we need to hear voices from the real experts, from people who care for pregnant women every day of their working lives, for people who care for pre-born children, for people who care for women who have illnesses and pregnancy, no matter how severe they may be. And there are plenty of them out there. They're all over the world, and they're called obstetricians. And I thought, I thought, I'm not an obstetrician, so I can't uh, be cla claim to be part of that category, but I thought we need to have expert opinion on this subject. We cannot follow the lines of Claire Daly and all of these people who were spinning narratives on the TV to make people believe that Ireland is somehow failing women because we do not have access to legal abortion. And that one kind of realisation after watching that show eventually led to an international symposium on maternal health care that was done in um, the Law Society of Dublin in September 2012. And it could not have gone better. The room was packed out full of doctors um, from Ireland, obstetrician, mostly obstetricians, who have come to hear speakers from the US, from Ireland, from Africa, from Belgium. We had the world's leading expert on cancer and pregnancy, who is Professor Frederica Mant from Belgium, who concluded that in the cases of cancer complicating pregnancy, uh, an abortion will not improve the maternal prognosis. And the entire event was... Brilliant. Uh, a lot of information was shared and a lot of people realised that 
you know, these are the real experts. These are the people who know what they're talking about when it comes to treatments in pregnancy. When, I first started, when we first started out to, to think about this event and um, put this event together, I knew that you know, we needed to have somebody involved who knows at first hand what it is like to care for pregnant women and to treat these illnesses that may arise in pregnancy. And I remember I rang a doctor from Galway who may be, know, may be known to some of you here. His name is Professor Eamon O'Dwyer. And he, is, uh, he was Professor Emeritus from NUI in Galway. And I remember ringing him, and I always had lots of questions for him about obstetrics and how do I answer this argument and what about in this situation and that situation. He was always really open to any phone call, answering any questions, um, and was really instrumental in helping us to put together kind of the arguments that we needed to combat the lies that Claire Daly was, was allowed to say on, on Vincent Brown. But one thing in particular stuck out in my head in one particular phone call, um, and I was kind of really getting down to nitty-gritty medical with him. And he said to me, oh, and I've been an obstetrician for years in Galway. I've personally delivered 5,000 children in the Galway region. Never once in my medical career have I ever thought that I would need abortion to help the, my medical service to women. And that really just resounded about. I said, I don't even need to know anymore. I don't even need to know any questions. For somebody who has such lifetime experience in this field, who has been involved in the care and the protection of pregnant women and of unborn children for so long and who is so solid and is so clear that abortion is never needed in the work of an obstetrician and Ireland and him and his colleagues are able to treat women with any condition in pregnancy regardless of any law. So it, Professor Eamon O'Dwyer chaired the uh, International Symposium on Maternal Health Care and then afterwards there was a statement released by the um, experts who testified at that meeting. And I don't know, I think it may come up here, but I'm going to read it out to you anyway. And it simply says, as experienced practitioners and researchers in obstetrics and gynaecology, we affirm that direct abortion, the purposeful destruction of the unborn child, is not medically necessary to save the life of a woman. We uphold that there is a fundamental difference between abortion and necessary medical treatments that are carried out to save the life of the mother, even if such treatment results in the loss of life of her unborn child. We confirm that the prohibition of abortion does not affect, in any way, the availability of optimal care to pregnant women. That statement the next day was featured in the Irish Times, and between then and now has gone on to, ga to gather over 700 signatures from the real experts, the obstetricians who care for pregnant women and unborn babies every day of their working lives, who support the fact that they do not need abortion to provide optimal care to women. They do not need direct abortion in order to provide a first-class service to pregnant women. I was really privileged to work with Professor Raymond Dwyer on the symposium, but like most of you, I have long known and admired both his professional reputation and his unwavering advocacy for both mother and baby. I thanked Linda Gorman earlier and I said that this is, all, this is usually a, a thankless vocation and not that we require or, or need thanks, but every now and again, people's dedication and commitment to this cause do need to be recognised. And I'm absolutely delighted to invite Professor Eamon O'Dwyer, who's here with us today, and his wife Joy, together with him. In recognition of a lifetime spent caring for pregnant mothers and their babies, and in acknowledgement of his tremendous achievements in protecting human life, I am deeply honoured to grant the Life Award for 2014. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> I really you know, am a facilitator, if you like, or a catalyst. I first became involved in the pro-life movement over 30 years ago, and it happened like this. The pro-abortion lobby was growing in Ireland under influence from the United Kingdom. And a few of us lawyers and doctors met in Dublin and we said, what can we do to stop this? The Constitution of Ireland said that the state recognised the right to life of citizens, but to be a citizen, you had to be born. So to make the unborn a citizen, it meant the Constitution had to be changed. So I became the, the political lobbyist, and I lobbied the Fine Gael government for about a year, and I was very well received by them. They were very sympathetic, but nothing came of it. And then there was a general election, and I went up and I collared the new Taoiseach, Charles Hoy, and said, now look, you have to do something for us. We've done a lot for you, something for us, and we need an amendment to the Constitution. So he said, well, leave it to me, leave it to me, and I'll think about it. And lo and behold, in the middle of 1983, he told me that in September he was giving us a referendum. It was up to us to decide what to do with it. And the referendum came in September, and it said the state recognised the right to life of the unborn, with the equal right to life of its mother. And that set me into the pro-life movement, as it were. And I've been privileged to be working with them in the background ever since. And I tried and tried and tried to convince the Taoiseach, current Taoiseach, that we didn't want the Californian experience here. And I'll tell you what that is. In the 60s, the state of California amended the law related to abortion to give the right of abortion to women who are mentally ill, so ill that they should be hospitalized. Well, in a year after that, there were something like 60,000 applications for abortion and nearly as many were carried out. So the Supreme Court of California looked at this and said, heavens, there can't be that number of people in California who need to be in institutions. These are not mentally ill people. These abortions are social ones. So I wrote to the teacher and I asked him, was it the way he wanted us to go? And I got no reply. And I wrote to him again and reminded him and I got no reply. And then the psychiatrist, of course, took up all this and gave their, their imprimatur to the fact that abortion was in no way associated with the management of suicide ideation. But anyway, the rest is history. And I know that given time, we will reverse that decision. I may not be around to see it, because I'll be 90 if I, li if I live for another three months. But I know it will happen, because I see there's a mood for change in the country, a mood for honesty that isn't there now. Thank you very much. wonderful person so we're going to go to a tea break now two the two um notices really quickly one when you come back there's a massive massive crowd i think there's 800 900 people here so when you come in can you push all the way in on the seats so if there's any seats left in the middle they'll now be the seats on the outside when you come back fill every row please secondly the father morris's bid to get jesus to number one for easter 
is already happening, okay? He's at number, I think, 58 in the charts. If you all go out and buy a CD, 